All right. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the September evening edition of the virtualized AWS Portsmouth User Group. Um, one of the cool things about the fact that we are now virtualized is that we can get people from all over the planet uh, and, and all over the world to come talk at our, at our little Portsmouth User Group. Um, Fun fact that I just found out, Nader and I spent some time in the exact same town uh, back during university days. Um, uh, so, so fun little trip down memory lane right before we hit record. Um, so before he gets into it, let's uh, go through the show notes. Uh, this is the AWS Pug. If you want to connect with us, you can go to awspug.org where Mr. Planky has made a wonderful website uh, with all of the links and, and Slack invites and all that good stuff there. Or you can at AWS Pug, where we are watching the Tweetosphere. Uh, if you have any questions for our speaker tonight, then we can, we can answer them from there or from the Slack. If you go to awspug.slack.com, you can get a little invite and jump on and join us, and we can all chat in there. If you are talking tonight, uh, or actually, excuse me, if you have a question tonight, please unmute yourself and ask the question of our illustrious speaker. However, if you are not, please feel free to mute and, um, and make sure that, you know, all of those things are... Done. All right. Um, so, quick thank you to our sponsors. Uh, as always, AWS, of course. Um, tonight, O'Reilly is actually going to be helping us give away two copies of Nader's book. So, um, super awesome. Thank you for, to them. Um, and as always, we've got all of the sponsors that have, have been helping us out for the, ent the entire three and a half years that we've been around. Tonight, we've got, we're doing something a little bit different. We've got a bit of a pop quiz. Um, we have what is potentially a choose your own adventure for, for the November, is it, Chris, is it, the, is it November uh, presentation? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So for the November presentation, we've got a couple of different options. Our presenter has a number of topics and he said, hey, which ones do you guys want me to talk on? And we were like, hey, why don't we ask everybody so that we can get a consensus? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch the poll and there you see the options for the November meetup. So whichever one you feel like would be of, of most interest to you, please feel free to click. We've got 18 people in the room. And um, so ideally we'll have 18 answers. And just for some context, our speaker uh, that month will be Gunnar Grosh. I hope I said his name correctly, but he is a serverless hero. Um, and so he gave us a couple of different topics that he can present on. And we wanted to, you know, like Chris said, give you guys the choose your own adventure path. Um, so you'll be helping us out, helping us out if you uh, make a selection and, and you plan on joining that meetup. If you want to choose building reliable serverless applications, please turn to page 16. All right, we'll let this go for another hot minute and then we'll wrap it up. Actually, you know what? We can just leave this running, can't we, Chris? Is that how this works? Uh, yeah. All right, so, so we'll just leave this running. Uh, if people jump in, uh, feel free to, to vote on that. Um, so while that's going, Mr. Planky, would you like to introduce our speaker, please? Yeah, so our speaker tonight is Nader Dabit, and tonight we're gonna learn about using AWS uh, for machine learning and specifically leveraging the Amplify CLI to build real-time image tracking application using Amazon Recognition, AppSync, and Amplify. Um, I first started seeing Nadish con uh, content on Twitter when I started using Amplify. Uh, pretty much every Google query I was putting out for the Amplify space was coming to one of his articles on the various publishing platforms or his Twitter feed. Um, so I'd been following him for a while. And then back before COVID, uh, I had tried to coordinate with him sometimes that he might be able to come visit us in person when things were a little bit more difficult to navigate. Oh, when, when will you be on the East Coast and things like that? Uh, but the one of the few blessings of the COVID times are that we are now able to host people virtually. And so I followed up again and we were able to get him to present. Um, I think all of the other information you might want to know about him is on this slide. You've got his Twitter handle, which is a pretty valuable resource if you're getting started with AWS Amplify. Uh, not only does he post a lot of great content, but retweets a lot of great content, and uh, is just a great person to have on your Twitter feed. So highly encourage you to go follow him. And without further ado, I think we can turn it over to you. All right, I will go ahead and stop the share, Natter, and uh, feel free, if I haven't done it horribly wrong, you should be able to screen share now. Okay, cool.
it is entirely possible I did it horribly wrong. I'm, I'm new to this IT thing. <laughs> uh, no worries. One second. Let's see if I can get this going. Come on, Chris, you got any uh, jokes or something we can throw in here? Something. Uh, nothing that's fit for recordings with uh, AWS DevRels on the phone, because then, then the, uh, the recording will be flagged by marketing and, and uh, deemed inappropriate. <laughs> fun, fun fact about Randall Hunt, uh, the recording that we did from, from the, uh, the brewery, that, that was uh, not, not flagged by me because it was because I said something inappropriate. It was because Randall said something inappropriate. And uh, they, they wouldn't tell me what it was. Though. I was like, I'll just clip it out. They're like, no, you just can't share it. Like, Come on. That was, that was for our uh, AWS reInvent recap 2018, I believe, or 2017. It was, it was that really, really good one up at the, up at the brewery. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Nader. Right, yes? Oh, sorry. No, I'm just testing something here. Okay, there we go. All right, um, I was just really testing out my demo to make sure that uh, that, that was working <laughs> before. I started sharing my screen because it was working before. Your live before demo was brave, still man. working. <laughs> okay. And I have a bunch of demos actually. I have like five demos, but the main demo nice. was the one that you mentioned. Okay, uh, if, cool. Are you sharing your screen? I am sharing it uh, now. Here we awesome. go. Yep. If we can see it. Beautiful. So I'm going to be jumping around to a bunch of stuff, really. Like I have a presentation, I have a couple demos, um, but I kind of want to just start off with the Amplify docs because this is where, like, if you're interested in any of, this, any of the stuff I'm talking about, I want to kind of walk you through how to actually do this stuff. Um, um, basically, Amplify is separated into a few things. It's a command line interface. It's a client uh, set of client libraries for, um, for iOS, Android, JavaScript, and now Flutter. So all the stuff I'm talking about is kind of full stack and therefore we need the back end and the front end. But for the front end, you actually need um, specific API calls to be configured properly and things like that. So we actually you know, provide all that stuff. But um, what we're gonna be working with today is machine learning and AI and it's gonna be set under this category called predictions. So if you're interested in kind of all the stuff I'm talking about, you can go to libraries and then predictions. And then here you'll see links to kind of each of the things that I'm, that I'm, that I'm gonna be implementing today. So, um, you know, that being said, let me go through kind of a quick overview um, about, you know, the, the stuff that I'm gonna be talking about in the form of kind of like a slide, a slideshow. So I'll go ahead and start here. So yeah, thank you for the introductions and things like that. And thank you for having me. I'm really glad that um, we were able to work out something remotely and like you mentioned, one of the positive aspects of all of this, uh, this, this bad situation is the fact though that a lot of these tech events or just events in general are kind of going virtual and therefore we're able to kind of do more in-person type of events and, um, and meetups and stuff that were maybe not possible in the past. So um, I'm really glad to be here and to be talking about some of this stuff. This is actually the first time I've given this uh, exact presentation and really it's talking about kind of um, how to use Amplify the predictions category, which is kind of the managed machine learning. And my name, like they mentioned, is Natter Dabbitt. I'm a senior developer advocate. I've worked on the AWS mobile team now for almost three years. And the mobile team is really less of a mobile team now and more of kind of a client and mobile team. So we do a lot of stuff with iOS and Android, uh, sure. But we also are now focused on um, a lot of web stuff. So we have one of the fastest growing segments is JavaScript and web developers. And we're now focusing on like a lot of the web frameworks as well. And the web framework I'm gonna be using today is uh, React, but I'm also gonna be using Next.js, which is kind of a version of React. So I'll be talking about uh, the differences between AI and ML. I'll be talking about AWS Amplify and kind of how it fits into all this. Um, I'll be talking about the Amplify predictions category. We'll walk through how to build an app and then I'll share a couple of resources and hopefully we'll have time to do a QA and a as well. Um, so quick overview about what is uh, AI and what is ML. I think the main 
you know, difference around, you know, what are these two? Because they kind of get thrown around a lot and a lot of times they are used interchangeably. Um, so with AI, you consider things like actual decision making. Um, whereas with machine learning, you're enabling a system to learn things uh, from some type of data set. Now, when you're working with um, AWS, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about is using managed services. And when you look at Amplify in general, we, we tend to lean extremely heavily on managed services. So when we are trying to implement some feature, we try to implement like a serverless version of that or a managed version of that. So for the API category, we kind of have like a managed GraphQL API. For authentication, we have a managed authentication uh, service. And for ML and AI, we actually leverage a lot of the, the managed services as well. And um, AWS is just seems to be adding more and more of these services. And they're really, really easy to use. You know, all, essentially all you have to do is kind of enable an IAM permission. And then you're, you're able to interact with that, like say from a Lambda function or something like that. And these are some of the managed AI services. Um, the ones that we're going to be taking a look at today and some of the demos I'm going to be doing are Amazon Poly, which creates an, um, an MP3 audio um, based on some type of text. So you put in a text input, you get an MP3 as an output. Um, you can also use Amazon Poly across different languages. So you can generate English, but you can also generate uh, a wide array of different uh, languages. I think Amazon recognition is one of the most well-known um, machine learning and AI services that AWS has. Um, we'll be using that to upload just an image of like, you know, maybe a meme and just kind of like deconstruct what's going on in that meme. And um, yeah, these are, these are a bunch of the services. I'm not gonna go over all of them, but uh, we're gonna be looking at about a half dozen of these today, I think. Um, and then we have managed machine learning services. And these are kind of the things that you'll actually need to do more work with. So you might actually have to kind of understand how to uh, bring your own model and, and um, you might be actually um, uploading data and kind of uh, working closer. Whereas a lot of the uh, managed AI services are just an API call. You pass in some JSON or some text and you get some JSON response or you maybe upload some type of uh, um, image or video, and then you'll get like a JSON response. So um, with that being said, let's take a look at Amplify. I mean, I'm not sure how many people here have used Amplify, but it's starting to get more and more popular uh, in the AWS ecosystem. But um, let me kind of deconstruct the differences between the different parts of, of Amplify, because uh, when it first came out, it was just a set of client libraries, but now it's a bunch of different things. So the main three parts are really uh, the CLI, uh, the client libraries, and the hosting service. And I've also added kind of device farm in here, but in reality, I would kind of like leave that out. Um, but the CLI is what you would use to generate, you know, new AWS services. So in our case, we'll be generating new machine learning services. The client libraries then allow you to interact with those services. So we have a predictions API that you can import into your JavaScript app and then call the back end with some JSON and get a response. Uh, the console is kind of not really having anything to do with this, but it's a hosting platform that you can uh, host really easily uh, single page applications and static sites. Um, in the past, people used to use the AWS JavaScript and AWS mobile SDKs. I think the main difference is that uh, Amplify is just a higher level of abstraction and it offers additional features that the AWS mobile SDK doesn't allow. So for instance, um, if you needed to make an authentication request with the AWS uh, JavaScript SDK, it was, uh, it was quite a bit more code than if you were using the Amplify client libraries. Um, so for logging in, for example, we have you know, maybe three lines of code and the AWS mobile SDK would have been maybe uh, a dozen or, or, or more lines of code. So it's kind of just a higher level abstraction and it's a lot more opinionated, I would say, than the AWS mobile SDKs. But you can use both of them in the same app if, if you need to for whatever reason. So um, the, all of the parts of the Amplify framework, which is the CLI and the client libraries are all open source. So a lot of the feedback and a lot of our roadmap is actually driven by the open source that we have out there. So we have a lot of issues that people open. We actually open RFCs there and we get feedback and we kind of prioritize things based on the response that we get there. 
So it's really easy to be customer driven when you have everything out there in the open and anyone can just jump in and complain about something or they can say, oh, this is awesome. Can you make this even better? All those different conversations are completely wide open. And it's really helpful to kind of be able to have that type of open forum to discuss things and, and also kind of um, see the problems that are there and, and try to address those. So it's a lot different than just a typical AWS service uh, in, this, in the sense that we are very open about what's going on in our roadmap and things like that. Um, the, all of the Amplify libraries, again, are kind of a lot more opinionated than the AWS uh, JavaScript or, or the other AWS uh, native SDKs. Um, we build in a lot of best practices. So whereas with the AWS mobile SDKs or the JavaScript SDKs, again, we had a lot more configurations that you were able to kind of like uh, to configure yourself. We automatically will um, you know, make those decisions for you with escape patches to kind of also let you break out of those for edge cases that, that you may run into. So the categories that, um, that we support right now are kind of listed here. Um, the most recent additions are data store and predictions and predictions is what we're going over. A data store is kind of an offline real time persistence layer for building you know, real time and offline applications with GraphQL. Uh, we also uh, support analytics. We have a couple of API categories, REST and uh, GraphQL. We have uh, authentication and, uh, and using the client libraries after you're signed in. We also use um, a lot of the um, implementations of our API with auth authentication for authorization. So we'll automatically do things like um, allow you to generate your GraphQL API based on different rules that you can set based on the authenticated user. So for instance, if you need uh, some type of fine grain access control that can all be configured and everything kind of just works together. Um, we're not gonna really go over any of these other ones, but uh, you can kind of see here what all is supported. So those, that's kind of the client libraries, but the CLI is what uh, you could uh, essentially think of as kind of like a cloud formation provider, something like the serverless framework, what that brings to the table, something like SAM or even uh, uh, CDK. So you essentially, you're gonna use the CLI to create this cloud formation, but it's a lot different experience because um, I think that this is a really, especially good experience for getting up and running quickly or for developers new to cloud computing or people that uh, just want to kind of um, not have to write a lot of code. The CLI is gonna kind of like walk you through questions and then generate that cloud formation for you. Um, it'll then allow you to update and, and create all that cloud formation for you. But uh, the trade-offs with the CLI versus something like a, uh, CDK. CDK um, is, has a lot more of a closer feature parity to like what AWS actually supports. Whereas the CLI, we're kind of behind because everything that we do is based on kind of what is supported you know, by the AWS service. A lot more work kind of goes into all that. So we kind of have a smaller feature set, I would say, than, than some of these other providers. Um, so this is the CLI um, categories. What does the CLI allow you to do? Um, you can create authentication service with Cognito, analytics with Pinpoint. You can create a combination of REST APIs. So for instance, uh, you can kind of connect DynamoDB with a Lambda function with um, an API gateway endpoint. You can connect just a Lambda function and API gateway endpoint. You can connect a GraphQL API with DynamoDB. You can do a lot of different configurations. You can set up triggers. You can do all kinds of stuff. Um, also functions, um, API gateway, chatbots, all kinds of stuff. The main thing that we're, we're gonna be focusing on is predictions. And this is kind of what the workflow looks like. So you, uh, you create a new Amplify project and then you're kind of then able to add services. So you would uh, add a service like predictions by running Amplify add predictions. You would then deploy that update by running Amplify push. You can then update again by running Amplify configure or Amplify update. And then you can re remove a service by running Amplify Remove. The client libraries are kind of uh, very, you know, uh, I think we kind of went over a lot of this, but essentially um, the, the one thing I guess I haven't really talked about is if you're using a platform specific library like React Native, uh, React, Angular, or Vue, we also have a few abstractions that allow you to also get running up and running a little quicker than if you were to write all of this uh, yourself from scratch. So for for the most uh, popular use case, we have an authentication flow component. 
uh, that with, I think it's like two or three lines of code, you import it and then you wrap one component. So maybe two lines of code gives you um, an end-to-end -end authentication experience wrapping whatever components you'd like. So you could think of um, prototypes where you need a way for users to sign in and you need to then have access to that user's uh, ID token. And you don't wanna write all of that flow from scratch. You can just use this framework specific component for React or Vue or whatever, and you can have all of that up and running. You can even customize it a little bit. You can even ship it to production, but it's not gonna be customizable enough to where you can do everything, but it'll get you quite a bit. Uh, it'll get you quite far with just a few lines of code. Categories are almost at parity with the CLI. Actually, they pretty much are. So anything you can do with the CLI, you can pretty much do uh, with the client libraries. Um, you, all you need to do is install the client libraries. Um, this is gonna differ if you're using iOS, Android, or JavaScript, but for JavaScript, you would use NPM and just install uh, Amplify, and then you would import whatever categories you would like to use. So in this example, uh, we're importing API, auth, storage, analytics, and XR. And then we would be able to then uh, use it. And um, this is kind of uh, an idea of how it would look working with API Gateway. Um, with APIs, you are given an, an uh, API name in your configuration. So you would just pass in the API name and then you would pass in whatever path you would like to hit. So uh, going now into the AI and ML part, um, the predictions category is kind of what encompasses all of that. Pretty much you don't really have to have any machine learning experience because again, we're using all managed services uh, for the most part. They're actually on the, uh, on the native side, you can do some stuff with um, your own custom models and stuff. Um, it's all, you're about to see it's only about um, you know half dozen or so lines of code to kind of get up and running with this on the client. Um, we also have a GraphQL directive called at predictions that also allow you to kind of do all this stuff via GraphQL. So we're gonna be doing kind of a, an asynchronous approach on the client where we're gonna be using the predictions category. But again, you can also use the at predictions directive to do this via GraphQL if you're already kind of bought into the GraphQL ecosystem. So some of the categories that we support within predictions are translating text, text-to-speech, text recognition, uh, entities recognition, which is kind of like recognizing people, uh, real world objects recognition, which is kind of like if I took a picture of my office, it might say I have a computer and I have like a monitor, whatever. Um, we also support um, sentiment analysis, interpretation of text, um, uploading of images for automatic training and then transcribing text. Um, and the services that we use under the hood, um, so for instance, uh, Amazon Translate, it's basically uh, language translation and um, it's really easy to use. Again, all you need to upload for uh, the translation is some text and then it comes back in the response um, in, a, in a JSON format. Uh, for um, for uh, language, basically uh, I'm guessing the best way to kind of describe uh, poly is you can upload uh, any type of text and it would come back in an MP3. So voice, voice synthesization, I guess you could say. And um, Poly will allow you to do any type of any language that you would like. So for, for the most part, most languages are supported, most popular, langu popular languages around the world. So um, you can upload um, you know, whatever text you would like and get back whatever language you would like. And there's also different voices that you can kind of pick. So we're gonna roll through a few different voices that are supported for the English language. And then um, changing those out is really, really simple when you're actually making the call. You kind of just set that as a part of your configuration and uh, you get that, that um, response back. Um, Amazon Transcribe is one of the services that we're gonna be using. I'll, pro I'll probably actually fly through these services because I think the more interesting part is kind of, you know, actually seeing these in, in action. Uh, recognition, we, we talked about that for, for a minute. Uh, video and image recognition. Uh, text track, this is one of the, the slightly newer ones, I guess, that's, that's been put out maybe a little bit of, uh, a little over a year old or something uh, like that. Uh, Amazon comprehends. And finally, uh, the, the GraphQL predictions directive that I mentioned earlier. Um, essentially, what you can do is after you've set up your service using the CLI, 
Um, a lot of times people, when they're using GraphQL, they're bought into their GraphQL schema and they wanna make all of their API calls adhere to that schema. But they also want to kind of have everything available in that schema. So all of the data types, but also all of the operations that are available in the API. So if you wanna continue doing that and you're using uh, one of our other APIs like predictions, we just allow this predictions uh, directive. And all you need to do is pass in uh, the arguments that you would use for um, the actual translation. So for example, or for the prediction category that you're using. So for example, if you'd like to translate text, you would just pass in the text as an argument. And then basically what we would do under behind the scenes would be sending it to the service and bringing it back in a GraphQL response. And therefore you're kind of able to adhere to your GraphQL API. So with that being said, I'm gonna walk through a couple of demos um, and just show you kind of like how all this stuff works. So the first thing I'll do is I'm gonna actually create a new React app and walk through how to um, create a new uh, predictions category within that app. So let me go ahead and change the font size and make this uh, a lot bigger. So I know it's pretty small. Okay. Um, Okay, so I'm in, um, I'm in a project that I created before. I'm gonna walk through kind of what's going on here. Um, and then we're gonna also create, I guess, uh, a new project and, and kind of walk through it from scratch. So the first thing I'll do is uh, kind of do the from scratch project to kind of see how all this stuff works. So uh, to get started, you'll just create an application. Um, it could be React, Vue, or whatever. And I'll call this MLApp. And then from the uh, root directory of that app, you would then just create a new Amplify project. So I'm not sure how many people here have kind of used Amplify, but uh, I'm kind of gonna go through that process. Whoops. Forgot the name of this app, oh yeah, ML app. So inside the uh, React project, to an initialize a new Amplify project, you just run Amplify init. And again, um, Amplify CLI is essentially gonna be kind of like a cloud formation provider or, or something like that. And uh, when you initialize a project, it kind of just sets up the, the, the base cloud formation stack for you. So here, it'll, it'll walk you through a few questions and um, based on the type of project you're in, it should automatically detect certain things. So we give the project a name, um, we give the environment a name. <clears throat> We then uh, give our text editor that we're using and um, it's gonna detect that we're in a JavaScript application. So we'll just choose, uh, choose that. It's also detecting that we're in a React project so we can choose that. And then we have our source directory path. And if you've, um, if you've ever worked with React, you know that the, uh, the, the source code goes in this SRC directory. So it's automatically detected that. Um, and then you have the distribution uh, directory build command to build that distribution directory and then a start command. And then from here, it's gonna prompt you for the IAM user that you'd like to use. And this is gonna be kind of configured just like if you had a, an, um, your AWS um, CLI configured, it's gonna kind of work the same. So it's gonna look in that .AWS folder and it's gonna choose, uh, or it's gonna list the profiles that you have there. So I'm just gonna choose default. And while that's creating, I'm gonna go ahead and add AWS Amplify. And this is gonna go ahead and install the uh, NPM project for AWS Amplify or the NPM module. And then after this is created, we'll go ahead and open it up in our text editor. 
and we'll then need to configure the project with Amplify. So when you um, are working with Amplify, you are given, I'm sorry, when you're working with the Amplify CLI, you're given an aws-exports.js file. And this file is gonna be created uh, by the CLI once all this is done. So here you see we, ha we now have this aws-exports.js file. Um, and this is gonna be continued to be updated and configured for you by the CLI. And this just pretty much is like a key value pair of all of the different um, services and features that you've enabled uh, via the CLI. Um, a lot of times though, you're not using the CLI at all. So you don't like have this generated for you. So you might be bringing your own services or whatever. So if you're doing that, you can go to the uh, AWS documentation, Amplify documentation, and you can go to configuring Amplify categories. And here we've kind of documented each uh, category separately. So you can kind of see how all this stuff works. But since we're using the CLI, that's gonna be kind of taken care of for us. So, let's see here. So now that we've kind of configured Amplify and um, we've installed the Amplify library, we want to now use this AWS exports file in our app. So to do so, we're gonna to go to a root part of our app and that's going to be for us index.js and we're just going to import amplify Oops. and then we're going to um, import that aws exports file here so i'm importing both of those and then i'm just calling amplify.configure passing in the config and this is going to kind of uh, set us up to then be um, enabled to use all the different aws amplify apis anywhere in the app and then at that point, we can then import the predictions API once we've added that service and um, everything is, is gonna be configured for us. So let's go ahead and add one of the uh, predictions categories. So I'm gonna run amplify add predictions and this is gonna kind of, um, whoops. This is gonna walk us through um, the entire steps of kind of, you know, all the different things that are available. So the categories that are uh, enabled via predictions via the CLI are identify, con convert, interpret, infer. And each of these has additional things like within each one of them. So for instance, if we choose identify, we're gonna be able to choose either identify a text, identify labels, or identify entities. Um, and we also need to go ahead and actually enable uh, cognito identity pools because we're gonna need to use IAM for this. So now that we've uh, enabled Cognito, we kind of can now choose text labels or, or entities. So let's say we want to identify labels. We then can give a name for our resource to be identified locally. Um, we can either take the default configuration um, or we can go through an advanced workflow where we kind of choose additional configurations. So we can say identify um, labels, all, all kinds of labels, um, only identify unsafe labels. Um, we can now choose if auth users can access this, uh, this service or, or auth and guest users. So using authenticated users, the user would actually have to be signed in to a user pool. If we had auth and guest users, then we would be using um, um, the Amazon Cognito Identity Pool unauthenticated uh, access role, which would basically allow guest users to make calls against this service. So you would not to, uh, need to have someone signed in to, to use it. And after you've uh, created that, you can now run Amplify Status, and this should kind of list out whatever features you've added to your API. I'm sorry, to your app. So we've added auth because we need to have identity pools enabled for us to, to be working with the unauthenticated access and authenticated access. And then we have one predictions category enabled. This is the name that we gave it. This is essentially just the recognition service identifying labels. And the operation is gonna be then what happens the next time we run Amplify Push, which is what we run to deploy everything. And then this is gonna also, after we run Amplify Push, it should prompt us to kind of see whatever services uh, are again are available to be created here. And then it's gonna prompt us, are you sure you want to continue? If we choose yes, then it will, it will go ahead and create those. Um, I've actually already created a project with, with a bunch of different services. 
So I'm going to go ahead and delete this project and just jump over to that one. While you're doing this, I'll add from, you know, personal experience using this service. Um, Cognito is something that used to scare the crap out of me. Uh, it was so, so difficult to configure and so difficult to really understand what the different settings were. Um, when you get it wrapped in something like Amplify, uh, it's so digestible. And I know, you know, you might have said it was a little opinionated at the start, but it's something that works and it can get you an application with authentication running right out the gate. And you're not spending your time pulling your hair out over services like Cognito. So um, even if you've been scared of Cognito in the past, uh, Amplify makes that a lot easier. I would highly recommend looking into it. Yeah, the first time I actually jumped into Cognito after using Amplify, because I kind of had the opposite experience. I used Amplify first and then I was exposed to it in other ways. And I was like, wow, yeah, I agree. It is a lot easier. Hopefully we can make it even easier. There's just some configurations that we'd like to, we'd like to kind of enable everything. And I think the Cognito service is also improving over time. So I think the combination of like what we're doing and what they're doing is gonna to continue to just make it even better. 100% agree. I'd just like um, to say that I'm very sorry to hear that you went from Amplify to Cognito <laughs> because that is a, just a terrible direction to go. <laughs> so um, for the example app that I've created, I've actually built a couple of apps. The, the first one I'm gonna kind of show is just a um, example of like four of these different services, like built, you know, each one individually, full stack, like the front end, the back end. Um, and I've used Next.js to kind of do this, not really for any reason other than I'm kind of into Next.js lately. And um, it's pretty fun to play around with. And um, basically I've built this app and I'm gonna keep the console open so we can kind of log out some stuff. Whoops. But um, basically I have uh, created a couple of different types of um, predictions that we can test out. So you can identify text, identify objects, and these two, actually I forgot to add the links there, but here they are up here. <laughs> identify text, identify objects, text-to-speech and sentiment analysis. Um, so let's go to a really basic one first. So identify text. What, um, what is going on on the client and what's going on in the service itself? So to kind of test that out, let's go ahead and go to our Amplify app and just run Amplify status again. And this is gonna kind of show you what we have. Um, oh, what is it given? Let's see if it'll, there we go. So it's gonna kind of show us what we have going on here in, in, the, in the service itself. Um, Let's go up here. Oh, I think I might be in, oh, I'm in the wrong, I'm in the wrong folder actually. Let's see here. I have too many windows open. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay, so um, this is a different app that I'll go ahead and close that and we'll come back to that. So for the, for the Next.js app, this is kind of what we have going on. Um, I have four different predictions going on. I have uh, auth enabled because that's kind of like a prerequisite, you could say. And then I have four different predictions categories enabled, one for identify text, one for interpret uh, uh, sentiment analysis, one for identify labels, and one for speech generation. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna identify text from an image. We're gonna do sentiment analysis on a sentence. We're gonna upload an image and kind of read what's going on on that image and we'll, then we'll do speech generation. Let me restart the server. So the first thing we'll look at is identify text. So this is pretty simple enough. We're just gonna upload an image. Um, it's a, um, just a meme or something like that. And then we're gonna um, say identify. And this is gonna use um, recognition to kind of identify what's going on in the image. And the response that we get back is kind of logged out here. So all we had to do would be to enable the service and then on the client, we're gonna look at the code that kind of you needed to call that. But essentially uh, what we're doing is, is passing this image to the recognition service and then we get a JSON response. And the JSON response is, is logged out here. Um, it has a few different properties. We have a full text property that gives us um, what it read off of the image. 
So all the texts. Um, we also have it broken up into lines. So you can kind of see that on the first line, it says, all right, boys, it's a new generation, what? And that's actually correct. And then the second line is that. And then, um, then it kind of messes up a, a little bit. The R is on, it says on this, on the third line. Um, but you know, it's kind of, it's kind of hard to say because maybe it's the R was taller, but anyway, it's kind of close, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a decent, a decent, um, response. Um, it even has the vice president thing, which is way down here at the bottom and you can kind of barely read. And and then, later, I think it's picking here, up the R from the R star logo. Oh, you're right. It is picking up the R from the R star logo. <laughs> that's funny. That's, that's exactly right. Okay, cool. Um, and I've just kind of like, you know, I'll put that here as well. So um, to, to make that call on the client, let's, let's now take a look at that. So the main functionality that's happening is this right here. All we had to do would be to um, import the predictions category from Amplify, uh, get a hold of that file, like you know whatever state management you're going to use on the client. All you just need to do is get a hold of a file from type of file, file upload, and then you pass that in as a source. And then all you need to do is call predictions.identify. And then you kind of set the, the type of response you'd li like back. And then you set the source and then that's it. And then we get the response. And then on the client, um, you know, of course, with React, it's going to be different than, than something else. But in React, you, you can basically use these use state hooks or maybe a use reducer to kind of manage your local state. And then all we're doing is we're saying, okay, we have that response. Um, we want the text off of it, which is like all these four properties. And then I just uh, set the response.txt. And uh, that's it. You just uh, add it, add the service via the CLI. You're then uh, off to the races um, with just maybe, you know, this is like maybe 10 lines of code or something like that. And then, um, and then I'm basically doing some really basic stuff. I'm saying, okay, if there's an image after it's, it's uploaded, just show the image. Um, and then I'm saying, if there is text, like this is going to only show if the response comes back, then uh, we'll show that. And we're just JSON stringifying um, these, these lines here. So you kind of have that right here. So is that image being uploaded to an S3 bucket that you created via Amplify or where is that image when you say being uploaded, where is that image? Um, so you send it directly to the service and I'm assuming that the service is, is doing something with, uh, with S3 under the hood, but I actually, I, I don't know actually, but so no, we're not, we're not having to deal with S3 at all ourselves right oh. now. Cool. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, so that's, that's, that's recognition with text. Um, it's pretty simple. The next thing we'll do is uh, identify objects, which is also recognition. So we'll go ahead and upload that image again. Do identify. And um, here we go, we get basically an array. So we get like this labels and uh, each label has a name it has some metadata, and then if there's parents, um, it'll have that. But the main thing I thought that was probably the most interesting is the name and uh, the competence. So basically what I did is I took that data structure and I kind of mapped it into like a new data structure where we all, all we have is this. So based on the response that we've gotten from uh, recognition, we have comics is kind of like the most confident and that's right you know this is a comic that's pretty cool i thought like it can actually tell that this is, this is a comic um a book so i don't really know what if, if this if this thinks it's like a page from a book or something like that um it does recognize that there's humans and people and then manga which i guess is like a type of um cartoon or something like that, <laughs> or a type of comment co comic and then I'll just kind of map those things here. And if we look at the uh, client side code, um, it looks very similar. All we're doing is importing predictions from uh, Amplify and then call, calling predictions.identify. And this is a promise. And then when we get the, the response, we kind of like uh, just log it out. And then you can do whatever you'd like to with it. 
I'm basically just kind of, uh, again, mapping back over that and creating a new, uh, more normalized data structure. <clears throat> That's just as, as essentially an array of all those, those items. Um, the next one we'll look at is uh, text to speech. So um, we might want to, actually, let's look at sentiment analysis. This one's actually a little more fun. We'll, we'll, we'll then look at text to speech. So sentiment analysis can basically take a sentence and kind of give you some information about it. So I could say um, like something really, really positive. I could say this is the best talk I've ever seen. Okay. And we'll analyze this and we're gonna get back a response. Um, and the response kind of looks something like this. Oops. I'm sorry, I, I was kind of uh, logging out some other stuff here. So here's, here's the main response. We get um, a bunch of st different stuff. So we have the language, we have key phrases. Um, we have this sentiment, which is kind of the main thing I've been using. It's, uh, gives you kind of a few different fields. So, so you, you, may, you may take their result of, of predominant and use that, or you might kind of analyze this and use your own, right? Because sometimes these are gonna be a little close as we'll, we'll see. But um, you have a mix, you have a negative, a neutral, and you have a positive. So what I'm basically doing is I'm saying, okay, if this is positive, we're gonna show green. If it's neutral, we'll show blue. And if it's negative, we'll show red. And then we're just gonna kind of uh, log that out. And I've basically done that. So uh, I'm, I might say, you know, something like uh, something, I think that's neutral maybe. That's pretty, that's, that's actually positive as well. Uh, I'm trying to think of a neutral. I, I had a few neutral ones come up earlier. Um, so this is neutral. This is very neutral. <laughs> Might use a little foul language there. And we get negative is like 100%. <laughs> so it's pretty, I think it's pretty good. I thought, I, 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 out of all these different services I've used, I thought the sentiment analysis was kind of the, the, mo the most fun one. And the response actually comes back pretty quick. Um, what about, what about sentiment analysis for something that uses negative words, but in a positive light, like this shit is the bomb? Like that or something. <laughs> I'm gonna have to play with this now. <laughs> it's positive, it definitely does, it does that. I wonder if you just leave out the best. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sorry about that. I didn't mean to derail. I'm gonna go play with this. <laughs> yeah, I played around with this a lot. It's actually this is like the most fun one. So when you think about some like real world use cases with this, are people using this with like their chat platforms on their websites and things like that to get a good understanding of how their customers are are maybe reacting to their automated chatbots and if they should escalate those up to a real person or what are some real world use cases that you're seeing with sentiment analysis? Yeah, absolutely for user input. And then the user input is typically some type of conversational context. So yeah, absolutely. I think we see a lot of that. Um, a lot of times, like if, uh, if there's some type of feedback form that people have, like they can monitor the sentiment there and, and flag something if they have a, a scale, like a large scale type of application where they can't moderate everything, but they might have like an, uh, an API that, that enables this. And then maybe if it gets above like a certain percentage or something like that, they're, they're able to flag it. But I mean, but out of all of the services, this, this one to me seems like the most applicable to a lot of real world scenarios. And it's pretty, and it's pretty accurate. Whereas, uh, I mean, recognition is, is, is getting more accurate, but I've had some situations with recognition where I uploaded like, you know, things and they got it kind of wrong. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so on the client, this one's actually really simple. This one's a lot more simple than the other ones because all we're doing is sending text and receiving JSON. So um, the sentiment analysis is um, just a text input, you know? So we just have basically a text area with an input value. And, um, and then the response is gonna be, you know, that, um, that, that object that we, we looked at a second ago. 
And the, the main thing I, get, I, I took out of that is this, this sentiment here. So basically uh, we call predictions that are interpret. We set a, um, the, the text that we'd like to interpret. And then I'm using the response.text interpretation that sentiment. And basically I have kind of like a map of colors uh, positive, negative, neutral, and then based on that, I can kind of show this uh, this bar by having like a div with like a background color. Um, so, but but in reality, you know, you probably use this in a, in, a, in a different way. So let's take a look at uh, text to speech. Let's use some phrases that we used earlier, and I might turn my volume up because I want to make sure this registers because I'm. Uh, you can let me know if you can hear this. This is the best shit ever. <laughs> yeah, we can hear it. <laughs> um, you know, you've probably seen this type of stuff before. Uh, I think the main, I think the most powerful thing about um, using these services and the way that we're kind of taking a look at them now is actually chaining a few things together. So for instance, you might be able to kind of like take an image, read the text off of it, translate that text, then text the speech and like send that MP3 somewhere. I don't know. There's all we've seen some really interesting combinations of all of these things individually. Yeah, they they do play uh, they do play a role, and you can use them individually, especially like some of the the ones like sentiment analysis. But um, I think chaining a few of these together sometimes gives you some pretty interesting um, you know effects. So let's say we want to change the voice ID. We can just go in here and uh, change the voice ID to something else. You can also you can also set the language here. So um, let's say that we were doing a different language. We would be able to kind of set the language and then the voice ID would probably need to map to one of those languages because the voice IDs are actually different based on uh, the um, languages. Hello world. That doesn't sound like Amy. Let's try to refresh that. Oh, I need to restart the server. Yeah, there's something going on with uh, my next app. Every time I, uh, I make a change and then refresh, I have to, for some reason, reset that server. And the, the example I'm going to show next is kind of like a combination of a few of these things or, or a, few, a few services with Amplify put together. Hello, world. So based on um, the the person's voice that you choose, it's going to come back. So, um, and then the, um, the way that I'm kind of doing that is I'm using the um, audio API. And basically, because I'm using um, Next.js, and the initial load is going to be using server side rendering, I have to kind of do some, some weird stuff here to make sure that um, I'm not using that, but I have to do some weird stuff to make sure that the audio was available on the load because when it first loads, the audio API isn't available, but it is available on the client. Um, so the next thing we'll look at is um, this real-time image uh, recognition app that I built using some of these services together. Um, and essentially what we're doing here is we're using that same image recognition and we're gonna now detect what types of things are, are in the view of the camera. But uh, to do this, like, you probably don't want to detect everything because every time you detect something, um, in the case that I'm, I'm using now, I'm basically, um, you, you, you know, essentially, from what I understand, the service is gonna be kind of like charging you money, right? So you don't want to sit there and have something running and then like sending an image up there every second or 10 times a second, 100 times a second. So what I've done is I basically kind of used um, this algorithm that I just copied and pasted off a of Stack Overflow somewhere that lets you take the, um, the uh, visual representation of what's in your camera and uh, turn it into like a, a number. And then based on the, uh, that number, you can kind of diff the number every couple of like milliseconds to kind of see the pixels that have changed and therefore you can detect movement. So it's actually pretty simple. Um, all we're basically doing is kind of like, you know, having a number representation of the pixels on the screen. And then therefore, if I do like that, you can see that movement detected. And then what it's gonna do, it's gonna take a snapshot uh, of, the, um, of the screen and it's gonna go ahead and send that off to recognition. And then what we wanna do next is to kind of um, 
to see how this actually works is in another window, we're gonna be running the same app. Whoops. So I thought we'd be running. Oh, I think I know the problem. I, I, I turned this off. Let me go back and turn it back on. Um, we basically have two separate windows. So we have um, the detect and then we have the results. Um, and then we can kind of decide like what things that we'd like to detect. So if we want to detect, you know, um, like microphones or we might want to detect like pictures of cats, we can kind of say, okay, I want to have, um, you know, a certain number of things. So I might say, okay, I want to detect cats and phones and phone can and um, all right, bracelet. Then we can update those categories. And then now it's going to basically be um, listening to these things. And under the hood, what's going on is basically we're going to be having a GraphQL subscription. And that subscription is going to basically be listening to any updates that happen uh, on this side. Whenever a new detection gets, gets triggered, we um, upload the image uh, to recognition, we get the image object, and then we kind of uh, send off a mutation to the GraphQL API, and then therefore on the client, we're kind of listening to that. So what we might want to do is like detect the movement by putting up a phone, see if we can get that. I don't know if that's going to actually detect, but we can see now the labels here and see if, uh, if a phone came here now. It looks like we had a lot of other stuff though. So maybe try this way, see if it'll detect the phone. And there we go, the phone came up. Um, now let's, let's do something a little more interesting. Let's detect the cat by having an actual cat picture on my phone. I'm not sure if that's gonna work, but we'll see. Oh, there we go. We're detecting cats, so the cat came up. Um, we might want to now hold up a can. Hey, there's a can. And see if that works. So you can basically kind of set um, that the things that you'd like to track here and it comes through kind of in real time. And then again, like I said, mixing a few of these things together seems to bring about the most interesting results because yeah, one of these individually is cool, but um, kind of maybe hooking up like a GraphQL API or a serverless API um, with a client application with some use case, right? And kind of doing that, um, all that stuff put together seems to bring about more interesting things. Um, and, and, the, and the code for this is open sourced here under Dabit3 real-time image tracking on my GitHub repository. And I think that is it. So yeah, uh, I, I have a thank you slide, but I don't even have to show that. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the people that put this uh, this event together. And I am Dabit3 on Twitter. If anyone has any um, questions or wants to kind of hang out and talk, you can reach out to me there. Awesome, cool. Thank you, Nader. Um, so hold, hold on everybody, before we, uh, before we uh, pause for the evening, we're gonna do a little bit of a drawing. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and stop the recording now because Mr. Planky asked me to do so. So thanks everybody for watching and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Everybody that's in the room, hold on one second.